um, I'll just introduce you first. So um, today is the ninth lecture of our ongoing workshop as part of CRG series on migration studies uh, with the support from Rosa Luxemburg, Steve Chung and IWM Vienna. And uh, as Aminadi would uh, also mention borders, uh, so it is a it is an interesting day today. I mean, this is 14th August and we are sitting on the eve of India's Independence Day. And what, what better day to have a discussion on events that emanated from the partition of the subcontinent and who better than uh, Professor Amina Mawson to talk on this. Um, anyone interested on Rohingya refugees uh, might must have already come across her name. And I am personally very happy to introduce her because we go down a long way. Uh, and I must thank Calcutta Research Group for whatever interaction I have had uh, the chance of uh, with uh, Professor Mohsin. Uh, so Aminadi teaches in the Department of uh, International Relations, University of Dhaka. She graduated from the same department and later received her MA and PhD degrees from the University of Hawaii, USA and Cambridge University, UK. Aminadi has received several national and international fellowships, which include the East-West Center Graduate Fellowship, CIDA International Fellowship, Commonwealth Staff Fellowship, SSRC Fellowship and Freedom Foundation Fellowship. She writes on gender and minority rights, state democracy, civil military relations, borders and human security issues. Among her numerous publications, she's the author of The Politics of Nationalism, The Case of Chittagong Hill Tracks, Bangladesh, The Chittagong Hill Tracks, uh, Bangladesh on the Difficult Road to Peace, Ethnic Minorities of Bangladesh, Some Reflections on the Shantals and Rakhines, Women and Militancy, South Asian complexi Complexities, to just name a few. Um, we are very happy to welcome you, Aminadi. And Aminadi has been a long standing friend of Calcutta Research Group and also uh, and ve a very esteemed member of CRT. Thank you, Aminadi, for joining. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shrucharita, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I'm extremely sorry for this mess up. Somehow I thought that it is 7 p.m. Uh, uh, IST, which would have been 7.30 p.m. Bangladesh. And uh, uh, as she uh, pointed out, uh, like uh, I've been working on Rohingya refugees for quite some time now. And this particular study on the Rohingya refugee, I, uh, uh, I did it uh, in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Muhammad Atik Rahman. I don't know if he has joined me or not, but he was supposed to join me. Uh, uh, for this uh, presentation, uh, because this is a research that we did together, and uh, I would like to acknowledge Atik over here. And also, it was funded by the University College London. Um, uh, it was an award that they got from the British Royal Academy. So, can we move over to the next uh, slide, please? Yes, this is how, you know, like I would like to um, make this presentation. For, uh, I guess it is very uh, very important, you know, like uh, to when we talk about refugees and refugeehood and statelessness or displacement, whatever name we give it to it, even if it is forced migration, it is uh, very important to understand, uh, like uh, to understand the state that the nature of the state is very important. And uh, though I talk about populism and uh, uh, politics in Myanmar, but we can name it anything. Um, uh, like uh, even if, uh, uh, I mean, we use this, uh, we political scientists are very uh, fond of using different categories, which have, I would say, the, uh, fine defining lines, uh, but, uh, even, uh, but this is something which is inextricably linked to the process of nation crafting or how a modern state is built. And uh, my contention all along has been since I've been working on minorities for a long, long time, that it is essentially, a, but not only, you know, like, um, 
there is he hegemony embedded within the uh, ideology of nationalism itself. And uh, uh, our nationalist uh, struggles have not been bereft of uh, uh, this, uh, um, what we call hierarchy or um, hegemony that is there, which is uh, all pervasive. And you can, uh, we can see it, you know, the way states have evolved and the way politics shape, take shape um, uh, in the post-colonial states. That's why, you know, uh, particular, uh, I always uh, um, raise this point that how post is the post-colonial, that is something that needs to be interrogated uh, uh, over and over again. This is not only my position. I, I guess many, I mean, there are many political scientists uh, across South Asia and uh, on um, on this side of the globe, uh, which again, interestingly, is a colonial uh, mapping of the world. Uh, we do question that how post uh, uh, the post-colonial world is, and uh, then um, I talk about the uh, the violence and. My, my focus is on gender-based violence uh, uh, because uh, I look upon the state uh, itself as a gendered category, not only the ideology of nationalism, but also the state as a very gendered patriarchal category. Can we, and I'm not going, I don't go into the binary of man and woman over here. When I talk about gendered category, I mean some. It has to do with the relationship of power, the power relations that are embedded within the entire structure. When we talk about the state of Myanmar, it. Uh, I mean, uh, it is very uh, important to look at the uh, way the state has evolved. If uh, and something very interesting which takes place in the. Uh, many of the states uh, in the post-colonial states, I would not limit it to the post-colonial states anymore or to the what we label as the uh, global south, uh, but we increasingly see it in the, in the global north as well. Uh, if you look at, uh, I mean, th there are many things that are unfair or unjust, but which are done constitutionally. So my contention over here would be that uh, just because something is legal, one has to also, you know, like uh, understand or underlying uh, the underlying fact that whether that legal is ethically as well as morally correct or, and even if it is morally or ethically correct, then for whom is it, it is morally and ethically correct. I mean, there are different layers of hegemony and you, one can go back and forth over these, uh, on these arguments, but the uh, ma major concept is the concept of hegemony and the concept of whether one is talking of uh, some, uh, uni some values uh, like which upholds the dignity of human beings or, uh, uh, and the freedom of human being that is very critical for us to understand if you look at you know how constitutionally the state of myanmar has been able to uh, like uh, categorize a particular group of people as uh, stateless that is very important uh, for us to understand so myanmar got its independence uh, or a burma then burma i would say they got their independence um, burma got in 1948, but before that, they had a constitution in 1947, where we find, interestingly, um, that uh, people uh, who they had made uh, later on stateless or uh, who were, you know, denied the citizenship, they were included as citizens of uh, Burma in the constitution of 1947, where they are, the constitution clearly lay. Uh, stipulates that the people lie in the frontier uh, states, frontier by uh, and the um, in Arakan and uh, Rakhine, all these regions they constituted the frontier territory of Burma at that point of time. And uh, but interestingly, through the constitution of 1982, we find that uh, the citizenship law was passed and uh, color codes were introduced and one became a full set uh, citizenship, one became an associate 
citizenship and then there were uh, there was this category of naturalized citizenship and uh, it is important to see that you know they were asked to people were asked to produce and they also introduced the concept of national races so we find that uh, the racialization of the society took place and man uh, barma uh, has 135 uh, uh, races which they categorize as national races of uh, burma and uh, when uh, they asked for conclusive evidence uh, of citizenship that you have to produce documents uh, that uh, and you have to produce your ancestry has to go back as far back as to uh, 1823. Uh, uh, so these are uh, time periods, I mean, very difficult for people uh, when um, to have uh, evidence that uh, uh, either your grandparents or one of your grandparents, they were a citizen or they, they were uh, residing in that part of the territory. And the person claiming here has to be, an, a, a, you know, at that time has to be of the age of 18, has to be of a good character, has to be of a sound mind. These are very ambiguous categories. Uh, I mean, the state uh, somehow uh, takes upon itself uh, the prerogative to define uh, what is moral and uh, what is uh, sound mind and uh, all the, all these you know in our region where documents are not uh, so I, I would say that we are not used to do uh, keeping documents or papers and for the colo at, at the colonial time uh, we are talking of a time period of 1823 i mean uh, just think of it how many of us have documents from 1823 in our hands today and this is something which was done uh, at that point of time uh, in 1982, that's why I'm saying that uh, it, constitutionally, uh, people were made uh, stateless. And uh, also, like uh, if you fit, uh, there was this movement which was known as 969 movement, 969 movement, which was uh, led by uh, uh, Buddhist monks. Uh, and uh, it is important to be, bear in mind that 72% of the population in uh, my uh, in Myanmar, in today's Myanmar, they are they belong to Buddhist uh, Theravada uh, uh, group, and uh, in two thousand eight, uh, the military uh, um, introduced another constitution through which the military uh, retained twenty five percent of its seats of of uh, seats of the um, uh, parliament or the legislature, both at the central and the state level. So. We find all these things uh, taking place in Myanmar. I, I, you know, these are these are some of the things that I've just uh, jotted down. But I'm explaining the things to you that how uh, one can become stateless by state mechanisms itself, and it is something which the uh, state did uh, through its own constitution, and then the state arrogated to its uh, to itself to define what is legal and what is, Ill, uh, what is illegal and what is moral and what is immoral. So our people who, do, who did not belong to the mainstream, they suddenly found themselves uh, to be stateless. And if we talk about the Rohingyas, I mean, if we talk about borders, let me talk about a little bit about borders over here, because the concept of borders somehow has not taken roots in the minds of the South Asian people. I remember talking to the to, uh, to Garo women back in 2004, again, again in 2016, and somehow I found that they do not have the conception of border at all. Um, and uh, they were like uh, referring to India, which is on the, you know, across the uh, Garu Hills, uh, they said, Amra uh, um, we, we cross over to, to the other side. The, uh, I mean, they had little notion that the other side constitutes a sovereign state and it is a border state. And uh, when I asked them that, why do we just cross over? They, they were very clear about it, that we just cross over to get uh, our essentials or to attend social functions. So, 
and they feel very connected with their relatives on the other side of the border. And this is something which has happened, you know, like in this region for years, for the uh, for centuries, people have migrated and they were connected through these borders. So uh, suddenly they became uh, dividing lines. And if, I mean, uh, if you look at this uh, particular slide, one finds that uh, how when, you know, when I am talking about populism and ethnic violence in Myanmar, uh, particularly in the Rohingya context, one has to keep in mind that how, especially the Rohingyas were uh, targeted and um, like, uh, uh, if you look at the concept of populism itself, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, there are different ways you can define populism. Uh, uh, one, def one can define it uh, 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 through the theory of relative deprivation that uh, if there is anything lacking, then a populist leader uh, might emerge among the, who, who, who can appeal to the peasant community or who, who uses different uh, elements which are uh, close to the heart of the majority of the people, like religion has been constantly used. And uh, uh, we have seen that uh, happening, uh, this is something which is happening in India, which is, it is also happening in Bangladesh. We see this where being, uh, 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 you know, this is something which is occurring uh, not only, uh, as I said, that not only in the global south, but also in the global north also, we are seeing populism uh, taking uh, its uh, di different forms. I mean, the fact that Donald, someone like Donald Trump could get elected in the Un United States was just because of, uh, out of sheer uh, populist uh, uh, politics. And uh, one can also define it through institutional means that because uh, democracy could never take roots in uh, certain places or in certain regions, and it's the lack of democracy which gives rise to this uh, populism. There can be populism from the top, there can be top, uh, populism from the below also. When I say that populism from the below, uh, this is something uh, which, is, uh, which has happened earlier also, but uh, which I see happening more now that uh, somehow faith-based leaders, they become uh, very popular in, uh, among certain sections of the society. And, uh, they, uh, and we see that uh, the leadership at the top also tries to make uh, coalitions with them or make concessions or, make, or, go, or it goes into power sharing with them. So one sees populism from the top and some uh, and somehow, at, uh, you know, the leadership at the top also appropriates the same slogans or the same symbols that one sees that the leadership or the faith based leaders from the below are using. That's why I'm saying that populism is something uh, which uh, which is not necessarily from the top. It can happen from the below also. I would look at the 969 movement. As, a, as populism from the, the below, which was uh, uh, again supported by populism from the top. And when I say that, you know, that racialization of the uh, society, if you, if you see that, you know, how they, uh, they targeted, uh, when, they, when they were targeting the uh, Rohingyas, they were particularly using certain words like uh, uh, Kalar, uh, or um, if we look into the history of Myanmar, Burma, even in the pre-colonial period when migration was on, and uh, during the colonial period also, they used to call uh, people, um, you know, like uh, uh, people who were migrating, which was a natural phenomenon at that time, as kulas. Later on, they termed them as kalar, means some, you know, because they did not have the same complexion and they were negated like that, that they were, they were dark complexion. And um, you can see that even Aung San Suu Kyi, when she was at the ICJ, she made it very clear that uh, uh, the Rohingyas are um, uh, Muslims. 
but though she did not say that they were from Bangladesh, but she said that they were uh, Muslims. And this Muslim word has become a slang for them. Uh, and uh, somehow to maybe to counter that, when I talk to the refugees in um, the refugee camps in uh, Cox's Bazaar, the Rohingya refugees, they, uh, they asserted uh, that we are Rohingyas and we are Muslims. Uh, so this is something when uh, I would say that you, uh, you people often we see that they adopt uh, those uh, uh, identities which had been used to negate them. In the case of the Chittagong Hill Treks also, I have found that the Bengalis used to negate the hill people uh, as uh, Jumma people, you know, who would... Uh, who would uh, practice uh, the slash and burn or jhum cultivation. So do you, and it was used as a derogatory term, but later on when the hill people, they uh, constructed an identity for themselves, they took the name of uh, Jumma identity, which is an occupational category. Uh, but uh, uh, this is what I'm trying to say that, you know, people APRA, somehow they, uh, try to adopt those identities which has been which had been used to uh, negate them and these are the different periods when we saw that uh, different uh, you know like uh, there was sectarian violence in 2012 in 2016 in 2017 what happened it was a clear case of uh, uh, genocide and um, um, because it was targeted uh, against uh, the Rohingya people, and the UN has called it a, a classic case of uh, ethnic cleansing. And uh, before, the, and if you look at the actors, you know who were involved: the border guard, police, Buddhist uh, Rakhine uh, communities, uh, Myanmar military, and uh, the target were the Rohingya uh, people. Well, uh, there are different, um, when, as I pointed out that I'll be talking about uh, gender-based violence, uh, though, you know, when, though I'm uh, talking about gender-based violence, I do not uh, in any way want to negate the violence that was perpetuated upon the entire Rohingya population, but uh, my concentration was on the uh, Rohingya uh, women. And uh, one can see that latent uh, forms of gender-based uh, violence in Myanmar, which uh, uh, one can also categorize as uh, structural violence, uh, uh, like no marriage without permission. Uh, if, uh, if we go one by one, impose restrictions on all, all aspects of their lives. So, this, was, uh, this happened in the case of the entire po uh, Rohingya population. And uh, in the case of women, it has a different kind of impact because at it, as it is, uh, Rohingyas are a very conservative people and uh, uh, women and girls in their societies, uh, they are not allowed to move out of their homes. Uh, and they think that uh, it is a sin for the girls to get their education. So if you are operating in a uh, framework like that, uh, and uh, if there is a general imposition on the on restriction, uh, restrictions on uh, movement, then you know, like uh, women are doubly restricted. And uh, one can add to it the element of security also because uh, the family would feel insecure in allowing, allowing their uh, girls to move around uh, and um, because the, as it is, they are bad, uh, the Rohingya people, you know, by, because of their traditional values, they do not allow the girls to go out of the house. By the time they reach their puberty or they are 10 or 12 years old, uh, the, the girls are not supposed to go out. So. Uh, and uh, they can add uh, the security dimension to uh, it as well. Uh, and um, which is, uh, I mean, in the 21st century, it is quite unthinkable that uh, 
you are not even allowed to move uh, uh, from uh, one village to another without permission. And even boys, uh, men, uh, I'm talking of men and boys, they told me that they always had to carry their identity cards. And in order to move from one village to another, they had to, or to just to visit their relatives, they had to give bribes to the uh, border, uh, to the police uh, uh, or the, uh, you know, the village head who used to be a, a non-Rohingya person. So this was the kind of situation that they had. Then no marriage without permission. I mean, uh, they were not uh, allowed to get married without uh, permission. Why I'm raising this point? Because uh, one comes across several statements. If you go through the mainstream uh, newspapers in Myanmar, or if you even if you go look at the social media in Myanmar, you'll come across comments like this that uh, the Muslims have a um, their fertility rate is very high. They are polygamous people, and the population grows very uh, fast. Uh, so there should be restrictions on the on marriage, and uh, even for um, you know like people. Uh, interestingly, this did, did not stop polygamy within the uh, Rohingya community. One could easily uh, bribe people. And uh, uh, as I pointed out earlier, the village heads or the police uh, or, or the security personnel and get married again. And since there is the security problem all the time and the restrictions uh, on movement, so early marriage among girls is very high and the dowry system is also uh, 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 prevalent among the Rohingyas. So I'm no way I'm romanticizing the Rohingya community or the Rohingya tradition over here. All I'm trying to say that when you are in, a, in an oppressive situation, uh, uh, environment, when you are living in an oppressive environment, the internal oppression also increases. And uh, so somehow the women become the prime targets of it. Uh, the women and girls become the uh, prime targets of it. Then rape and sexual violence. I mean, um, this is something, uh, I mean, we are mentioning this Banu Begum, the name over here. And by the way, this is not a real name. I mean, uh, we have come across cases where uh, during uh, in two, not only in 2017, but before that also, there were many instances of gang rapes. Like uh, women told me that age was no barrier. Uh, for, they, uh, they referred to them as um, Bar uh, Burmans or Burmas. You know, the Burmans or they are often referred to them as mobs. So though it is one ethnic group, but see, when I pointed out that uh, in Myanmar, there are 135 ethnic groups, but the fact that they were only mentioning one particular ethnic group, that, show, that tells us something about how overpowering one particular ethnic group can be. So there was, I mean, uh, Shuchurita herself has been in the Rohingya camps, I am aware of that. So she must have uh, come across several cases where women, you know, women are openly talked about. And this is something interesting, uh, uh, or I would say very ironic about uh, the entire situation over here, that when I first visited the camps, uh, Balukhali camps in, uh, it was in uh, December 2000, I mean, in December 2017, and uh, it is interesting to note uh, that when, uh, you know, like men pointed out to me that go to that, uh, uh, that particular uh, house or, you know, they have these uh, small uh, tent houses and will find women who have been raped. And uh, the women were willing to talk to me and they said to me very openly that we are not ashamed to tell you that we have been gang raped and they, they and uh, like, uh, uh, they have uh, rape uh, has been committed against us. 
and I was wondering to myself, because I've been working on uh, 1971 also, uh, where, uh, you know, genocide was uh, inflicted upon the uh, population of Bangladesh by the Pakistani uh, mil military forces along with their collaborators. But somehow the incidents of rapes or rape, we talked uh, about rape and rape uh, that women were raped and uh, the term commonly used was that, you know, we won this independence at the cost of the honor of our sisters and mothers. And the, the constantly, you know, we were make, uh, we, we still make references to this uh, uh, concept of honor, women, and nation. But over here, I found uh, that they were not talked, I mean, they were not ashamed, they were not neither silenced, nor they were they ashamed to talk about the rape cases. So I, I was thinking that, uh, you know, this is just um, some, something that I'm thinking aloud, aloud that if it is that uh, trope of nation and nationalism, uh, where women are looked upon, as the bearer of the nation and the honor of the nation that silences the voices of the of women? Or is it because at that point of time, out of desperation and they were seeking justice for what has been done to them, that in a very conservative society where women are not even allowed to go out, men openly were talking about who has been raped and who has not been raped and women themselves were willing to talk about the incidents of rape and there it did not occur to them that it was a matter of their honor or it was a something that that is shameful which is normally regarded as a matter of shaming and all those things but rather what they were seeking was ju was justice and they, they felt that if only if they can bring out the atrocities that has been committed upon the entire community, they can uh, find justice. Uh, and uh, we did ask them, like uh, I was there with my colleague, Dr. Meghna Guhu Thakurta, and we did ask them that, you know, who, who were the people who raped them? And they described to us in details that they were wearing olive, gray, olive green, uh, dresses that is the you know the color of the uniform and that they had badges and that their faces were uh, you know covered all these things um, they talked about uh, to us very openly then self restriction on movement this I talked about uh, it earlier also and also we, one found that you know uh, they talk, they said that, uh, that they were frequent pregnancies. Uh, this is happening uh, in the camp uh, also. We find that uh, frequent pregnancies are there. But in Myanmar also, and this is something I alluded to earlier also, that you will find that uh, the Myanmar authorities making statements like this, that they would become uh, minorities. Uh, uh, I mean, the other races in Myanmar would become uh, minorities because uh, they have such a high population growth. Uh, the Rohingya people have such a high population growth. Uh, but um, they pointed out to us that they have frequent pregnancies because to avoid case instances of rape, to avoid violence against women, you know, like which is perpetuated by the um, uh, other, by the security peer personnel of the uh, Myanmar community or, or the uh, people from the Myanmar community. And uh, this is something, I mean, this is so, I mean, one can understand what a helpless situation it is that you, a woman has to remain pregnant over and over again to avoid uh, a, um, um, violence against her. But, uh, this is something which is so dangerous for her health also. And women are, I mean, these are different mechanisms that women use or the community uses, restricts the movement of its uh, uh, female population, uh, just restricts their education. And then uh, this frequent, uh, the instances of uh, uh, frequent pregnancies. 
and uh, then um, they, as I pointed out, that they had to give uh, bribe uh, to arrange marriages and no uh, education for Rohingya children. Then they also pointed out that there was a restriction. There were restrictions on uh, worship, and um, they were forbidden to say their Juma prayers the for Friday congregations, uh, and they were not allowed to carry and use mobile phones if they found any Rohingyas uh, would take away the mobile phone and they, they were put into jail and were punished for five year, years imprisonment. Uh, I mean, these are the different things that came out uh, from the interviews and the micro narratives that we took in the camps. We went there over and over again uh, to talk to them, but let me also make it very clear that they were willing to talk. It's not that they were unwilling to uh, talk. Then uh, they pointed out that in Ma Myanmar, they had to take permission from Ugata. Ugata means the, the person or the, or the village leader uh, to go to the market. Restriction uh, on family size was there uh, and couples were allowed to have only two children. Forced labor, calling names that Rohingyas were called as Kuwa, that is illegal Bengali and Kala. Uh, you know, dark complexion people and uh, abduction, uh, detention, all these things uh, took place in the name of uh, different operations that or crackdowns that took place. And the uh, culture of violence was there, social humiliation, uh, indiscriminate beating, torture on the ba basis of fake allegations of, their, uh, of them that they are robbers, and uh, somehow, you know, like this is something, this is a baggage I think they ca the people carry with them because I find that even uh, uh, when they are on this side of the border, I mean, there are allegations that, uh, the, the, that the Rohingyas are a very violent people and they can uh, do anything and everything. These kind of allegations are there. Then gender-based violence, I think I've talked about these uh, that, um, and what is interesting is that when they came earlier, they were will, very willing to talk about it. But over the, uh, my, uh, later on, I found that somehow uh, they don't talk about rapes as much as they were talking about it surely uh, to this uh, uh, side of the border. And, uh, like the, they talked about that, uh, like how they had to sell all their ornaments and personal belongings. And then uh, this, there was this woman who told me that uh, she was raped in front of her 16, 16 year old son. And then uh, when they were, uh, you know, running away or fleeing, uh, her son was, uh, uh, they said uh, that her son was, uh, chopped into pieces that's what she said to me and uh, she was saying to me that they could not even give her a uh, proper burial and she said to me that she wants to live in uh, she doesn't want to go back um, and she wants to live in bangladesh because at least over here she uh, she believed that she would get a proper burial so my point is that if uh, once objective in life is a proper burial that one what kind of life are we talking about you know if you can think i mean this is all you want from your life that you want to have a proper burial this is some certain things you know which uh, i think the entire uh, world community or the global community has to think about it's, this is uh, just a, the journey that they had to take uh, place uh, uh, that took place, you know, when crossing over. And hundreds of thousands have gone to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And they crossed, when they talked of this entire journey and how fearful and how scared they were and how many people in the groups were uh, uh, killed while they were crossing over. And women talked about, even when they were making this journey to, into Bangladesh, uh, how many of, the, of them were gang raped. And uh, if we talk about, uh, you know, like uh, there is this entire geopolitics, we see that uh, 
Myanmar is a, is a for the international community because uh, if you look at the Rakhine area, it is full of uh, resources. And we find uh, that uh, investments of China, India, Russia, the United States over there, and Myanmar has opened itself up. And they want uh, to uh, clean this area, uh, clean, I'm putting it within a code, uh, cleanser, uh, that would be a proper term for investment. Uh, and uh, if you look at the global community, the ASEAN, uh, their position is that they do not talk about the internal affairs uh, of the uh, of another country, but genocide cannot be an internal affair. It is a crime against humanity. One has to uh, keep that under my, uh, in mind. And um, and then what is happening that in Bangladesh we are finding uh, uh, fi we find that. Uh, uh, it's a very desperate situation for them also, and they are embarking upon boat journeys to Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, even to Europe, Saudi Arabia. And we hear about boat people and boats being sink, uh, boats being sinking, and all these incidents are taking place right in the front, uh, uh, in front of the eyes of the entire global community, but the global community prefers to remain silent because geopolitics and geoeconomics is more, somehow has become more important. Uh, and uh, the UN Security Council, it has not taken any action because China, uh, China's, uh, because of China's position, Russia's position, and um, unfortunately, India also abstains uh, uh, on these issues, they do not take any position on the, on this uh, uh, particular issue. If you look at the uh, demographic composition, 55% of the Rohingyas are children or minor among the nine lakhs. Among them, almost 30% are unaccompanied by their parents in Bangladesh. Of the entire composition of the Rohingya population, 52% of them are women and girl child. Widow and female households are there. And uh, so these are, this is the, the general condition there. I mean, the restrictions on move of, on movement, lack of, I mean, they complained of these things to us when we asked them that, what is the situation like? A rough terrain makes it difficult for them to move around. Uh, Domestic violence is, uh, I mean, uh, it is on the rise uh, uh, in the camp uh, areas and uh, uh, polygamy is there, dowry issues there. I mean, it is uh, very interesting to note that, you know, like within the camp situation also, uh, we can see child marriage, polygamy, dowry, domestic violence. Uh, all these are taking place. That's why I said that I'm not romanticizing the Rohingya uh, tradition or the Rohingya community itself. But um, in, a, in situations like this, one can imagine that how difficult it is for the uh, for women and girls to survive. Can we move over to the next one, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, that is it. Uh, if you have questions, so I'd like to answer them. I think my time is also over. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the very informative talk. And it was almost like a mental journey for me, uh, going through my field notes and uh, experiences. And I share a lot of what you um, said, and what you mentioned, and especially uh, a lot of food for thought on the points of race, ethnicity, and identity. Uh, on identity, I don't know, uh, Aminadi, whether you also uh, faced similar kinds of experiences. Um, I noticed a generation gap uh, and also a, a difference between the registered and unregistered refugees when they deal with the question of identity and race and also uh, whether they want to return. So for me, uh, even now when I in my rounds of conversations with uh, the registered refugees, most of them want to be integrated uh, uh, with the society. Though theoretically, I mean, uh, they of course say that they want the right to return uh, provided the ambience uh, is conducive, but uh, they're very clear on what they want, uh, unlike the unregistered refugees. 
and uh, i also think as you mentioned how uh, like your experience of the uh, women vic victims in the camps of 2017 it's slightly different than what i saw in 2019 um and that is also because i think over the years uh, the responses change in according to their strategies and tactics i think 2017 was the year of the fresh influx and 19 was when That's they had right. settled yes, down a bit right. and uh, the it was almost like a field by then and they knew how to sort of navigate their ways um and uh, yeah express their concerns and uh, sell them if i might uh, say so so we already have um questions uh nasreen di has a question followed by suchishmita so uh, nasreen di do you want to uh, unmute and uh, ask yourself thank you so much uh, actually i was just very curious um uh to bring the discussion back to the camps and you know suchita also you can probably you know along with uh, amenadi as well um you know i'm just reading michel aguirre's work on camp and encampment um so i was just wondering considering that the south asia region has not been explored but leaving that aside um the identity question remains kind of muted in some sense when we talk about uh, in relation to camp so would you say that given the situation uh, in bangladesh and the rohingya question um the identity formation seem to be in a very tangentially different to or rather let's say it differs between the registered and the unregistered refugees so let's say those who are in camps they seem to be having a different sense of identity or a sense of belonging let's put it this way uh vis-a-vis -vis their home country or is it the same thing uh, i'm just kind of trying to figure out if there a difference as such and the second uh layering to that is um how do they hold on to um this question of where they want to return to because obviously the return is impossible so what are the identity markers that differentiates in this situation let's say there is so much of solidarity so much of um sense of uh commonness right so is there anything kind of that kind of starkly you know stands out for you know the camp as such camp people let's put it this way uh can we take uh, one or two more questions and then maybe you can combine and respond uh so uh, shudishmita you have a question do you want to unmute and ask yes yes <clears throat> so thank you amina ji for your nice presentation so amina ji you pointed out one thing that uh, uh, rohingya women take repeated pregnancy to avoid sexual violence uh, in my interaction with rohingyas what i um, came to know from them that uh, pregnant women are rarely spared from violence also because uh, many has narrated that uh, the soldiers attacked pregnant women with some weapon and they directly hit at the lower abdomen of women and uh, you know naturally what happens and also they use sword to open up the uh, abdomen of the women this kind of narrative i have also received from rohingyas and uh, secondly in uh, my interaction with these people in jommu camps i also find that uh, they have uh, average 5 to 6 children and though they are it is difficult to say how much secure they are in jommu but uh, it is sure that they are not as unsafe as in their motherland so how can we address uh, this question of uh, high population rate among rohingyas and um, secondly i just want to know uh, something from you regarding your observation on rohingya women actually i find that uh, apparently they are passive but actually not they have also their voice but uh, somehow because of their culture they remain passive so this is my point of query thank you so much thank you let me start with shushmita's questions first uh coming to the pregnancy thing yes 
this is something you know like uh, about uh, pregnancy being used as a tool to avoid rape this the women themselves told me so and again i also came across the same statement as you said that even pregnant women were not spared so i guess uh, i mean when i asked them that when they were not spared they said that it was in 2017 so I, i'm i'm not sure if earlier they were spared or they were not spared uh, but uh, this is something they told me that we uh, ha we have these frequent pre pregnancies because we presume that if a woman is pregnant maybe they would not be violated or there would be less violation maybe it is a matter of degree that there would be less violation against them and you are right i mean as i said that yes i have come across cases where they said that even the pregnant women were violated and uh, how they were attacked and uh, the way they i mean what you narrated to me the the way they were attacked it is uh, the same you know like in the Yeah, in the Kutupalong camps as well as in Balukhali camps, I mean the weapons that the uh, 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 that were used to attack them were the same. It's not that they were just shot at, but they always said that they had knives, they had daggers, and they chopped. I, mean, I found this to be such a brutal way of. I mean, I just couldn't. I mean, the way like this woman told me that how her. one and a half year child was uh, chopped into pieces and then she said that she was uh, gang raped uh, and uh, i just couldn't believe you know which, uh, and she was all shaken i mean she when she was talking to me and she was holding her jaws and i asked her what has happened i mean why is it that she is holding her jaws like this and she said to me that because it still hurts she was i mean uh, there also she was hit so these were very vivid cases i mean the way they were really tortured and uh, i mean i i just don't know i mean when a mother mother narrates to you that how the ch their children were uh, cut into pieces right in front of their eyes and uh, and then uh, the world community keeps silent about it Uh, how does one explain the silence and uh, how does how does i mean how does one remain complacent about uh, cases of genocide coming to the question of voice yes i agree with you women have their voices in the camps uh, shuchurita you must have come across the concept of maji so initially they were more male majis maji means you know people who are uh, who is like a leader leader within the camps and uh, so now we have many female marches also and uh, then also i came across this woman uh, who is an elderly woman and uh, i found that while others were talking uh, sitting in the floor and talking to me uh, or they were sitting in uh, what we call piri or small tools but she was sitting in a chair and uh, people told me that she uh, belongs to a rich family uh, in the rakhine state and she's an elderly woman uh, so you know so they always have a chair for her and she was like talking with authority so i could see the class dimension also coming in uh, that when you have money or you belong to a family which is uh, traditionally maybe powerful in the in the village then uh, women have their uh, voices and and things have changed in the camps i mean from 2017 like last i went to the camp was in two, yes 2021 february 2021 i went to the camp um, amidst this pandemic I, i was there and i found that women are much more vocal now but though all of them had children for four months five months six months like uh, because uh, because of the pandemic situation uh like i could not go inside i had to ask them to come to a health camp and uh, five of them came and we were sitting at you know like physically distanced uh, from each other 
but if you look at the children's age, five months, six months, seven months, you know, barely one year. So you can tell that these are all pandemic babies. And they were all very vocal about it. And uh, let me also tell you that, uh, that uh, when I first went there, uh, like when I talked about the education of women and all those things, in two thousand, this is I'm talking of Balu Khali camp. Uh, they were uh, they they are the new arrivals or what you call uh, at that time, and they told me that it is it is sin for a girl, a girl to get edu education. I mean they thought I mean the women themselves told me, but then I went again in two thousand eighteen in two thousand nineteen in. Uh, then in 2021, by that time, their voices have really changed and they thought that women should get their education in 20, in 2019, they told me very clearly uh, that uh, uh, this particular man who has left his wife and he has gone to another camp and gotten married again. And the women were telling me what he has done is illegal. He, do, he needs, he should have, uh, you know, like he should have divorced his first wife. And if he doesn't divorce his first wife, who's pregnant now, then he, he should take responsibility for this child. I mean, this is something which they were not saying to me in 2017. So things are changing. And I'm not saying that, that when they came in 2017, they were voiceless. They were not voiceless, but it was a different kind of voice. I mean, the, uh, where they were talking of their own traditions, they were upholding their own cultures. Maybe that was, uh, this brings me to Nasreen's point, that may, maybe that identity was important for them or it, or, or it is still, ident uh, this identity is very important for them. Uh, but when I asked them, uh, when you talk, you asked me that if the, uh, about the identity question in the camp situation, no, it is not muted. I didn't find it to be muted. They, they openly say that they are Rohingyas and they are Muslims, and they openly say that they want to go back to their uh, uh, to their place, and they say that this is this is uh, they talk about homeland, you know, like uh, they talk about their fish ponds, uh, the uh, they talk about their villages, they talk about their markets, and they feel and but they also say that they will only go there once uh, they they feel that they're secure and they are able to go back uh, go back to their place with dignity. One woman said to me that, look, you, you are secure in your country because you have your own king. And in, in uh, back home, we do not have our own king. This concept of having one's own king, you know, king, the, she used the word own king. Aapne der raja ache, aapne raja, aapne raja means, that you know you are you are represented by your own people so one could see that that's that all that is also there in them that you need to be represented by your own people or or maybe whoever is talking or whoever is in power should also represent you so the, these are this is something uh, which a woman said to me in 2017 that's why i'm said i'm saying that yes the voices are there and the voices were there at that time also it was it is not that they were not there and uh, on the question of integration which shuchurita uh, brought out uh, yes there is a generational thing uh, uh, there like uh, People who, who were born, who came in the, not all who came in the late 70s or in the 90s, not all of them went back. I mean, uh, you go to Kutupalung camps, they are the, you know, they, they were born here, they grew up here, and you can see the tension also between the new arrivals and the old ones. They don't openly talk about integration, at least they didn't say to me that they want to be integrated. Maybe because I'm a Bengali, uh, I mean they have their strategies also. Yes, uh, that's why, they, and I'm, I'm not only a Bengali, I'm also a Bangladeshi. Uh, that uh, that is also very important. But as for the markers of their identity, uh, they uh, they constantly say to me that they are Rohingyas and they are Muslims. So these are the two markers that they are using. 
and I asked them that, do you think that you are Bengalis? They said, no, we are not Bengalis. And they, they said that they were, uh, I mean, this was a calling name for them in Myanmar. Thank you. Uh, so we have four questions and I'll read out the first two and then Rafikullah maybe he can come in briefly and then I'll go to Sri Ponlas. So uh, Joy Kormokar asks, what was the purpose to categorize different types of citizenship after decolonization by the state? Uh, did the Rohingya ever claimed for separate Islamic statehood within Myanmar? Uh, then Kum Somali asks uh, something which you have briefly mentioned. Uh, is there any responsibility related to ASEAN community or international community uh, about the Rohingya crisis? Uh, so Rafikullah, maybe you can just ask your question and Aminadi can take three and then we go to Sri Pannas. Good evening, ma'am. It was a nice lecture, uh, but it was very disheartening to learn about the plight of the women. My question is like, we, we all know that our women whether in the family or in the workplace, everywhere they face this violence and cruelty. Uh, I really wanted to know what happens within the camp. Do, do, do women, uh, what kind of violence and what kind of uh, abuse that women face within the camp? And is there any uh, justice delivery mechanism within the camp to address this issue? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, what was the purpose uh, to categorization? I mean, that is the whole point I'm raising. That, you know, when I say that when we talk about post-colonial states, how post is the post-colonial state? I mean, you find uh, one hegemony and then you produce, reproduce another hegemony. And um, the purpose was to, you know, when you have different categories of citizenship, uh, this allows you to... Uh, you, you, you kind of, I mean, if you look at the Sri Lankan case also, uh, you somehow, somehow, I mean, if they, I mean, it's a very conceptual question uh, that you are raising, that you want to establish the hegemony of one particular group, because the, po the post-colonial states, these are multi-ethnic groups, uh, multi-ethnic states. And uh, when I say multi-ethnic, I mean, we, all the ethnic groups you would find, see, they have their own languages, they have their own cultures, but some of the groups are, uh, maybe they're closer to power, or maybe they have more economic power, or maybe they are, dom uh, they are dominant in terms of uh, uh, demography. Or, so you, it is to establish the, authority, the hegemony of one particular or one particular ethnic group over the others that you have all these categories. And no, I don't think that there was, a, uh, you asked if there was any um, attempt to have a separate uh, Islamic sta uh, state uh, by the Rohingyas. I mean, if you have, if you look back into the history, uh, 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 you would find that, you know, if during the pre-colonial period, there were between the Muslim population and the non-Muslim population of that uh, yeah, of that re region, or what we call or you, what we call Burma. You have to chase the history of that region. And uh, Arakan was an independent kingdom for a long time, and uh, also. During the Second World War, uh, while the uh, while the Buddhist population they supported the Japanese, uh, the Muslims they supported the British. So this tension, this uh, between the Buddhists and the uh, Muslim population was there uh, from the pre-colonial period. And there are allegations that, you know, at the, uh, that uh, after uh, the, after independence also, you know, like Arakan army, all those things, uh, we keep on hearing about this. But if you talk to the Rohingyas, they always say that now they had not been part of the Arakan army. So I'm saying this because, you know, there are attempts to securitize the entire thing 
and to, uh, and this is an argument which uh, the Myanmar state uses that <coughs> that the Rohingyas are terrorists. They belong to secessionist groups. Well, there are other secessionist groups also in Ma Myanmar, but uh, they have not been made uh, stateless. So one has to understand that. So, uh, and this is something. Uh, cessation is a call, I mean, movements for cessation, or even if you call them people's autonomy movement, these have gone on in uh, post colonial states uh, for years. Even today, countries are facing uh, autonomy movements, but for that, you do not make up a group of people stateless. Uh, this is something, this is altogether a different uh, uh, issue. And uh, coming to the question of ASEAN's responsibility, I think the entire world community has a responsibility to respond to the Rohingya issue, not only to the Rohingya issue, to all refugee issues, and particularly where genocide has been com uh, committed. I'm, uh, and uh, genocide, as I pointed out, that this is a global problem. This is not a problem between Bangladesh and Myanmar. We are very clear on this. This is not a Bangladesh's problem, but somehow the gaze of the world seems to be on Bangladesh. That's what Bangladesh should do and should not do. But one has to put the gaze on Myanmar. And why I brought in ASEAN, because Myanmar is a member of ASEAN. And if you're a member of a regional organization, that regional organization has a responsibility. Uh, you know, like uh, there are certain principles upon which uh, uh, you know, membership to different uh, um, states are given, uh, and ASEAN could and ASEAN has investments in uh, 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 Myanmar. That's why I brought in that uh, because uh, Myanmar is a member of the ASEAN, uh, they have a responsibility. But then Myanmar is also a member of the United Nations. The United Nations also has a responsibility. That's why, you know, in the beginning, I said that what is what is done constitutionally, what is done legally, uh, I mean, you cannot say that uh, these are illegal things. Uh, but uh, uh, again, how ethical and moral this le these legal principles are, that is something that needs to be questioned over here. Uh, and uh, on the question of what is the uh, uh, um, position in the camps, in my presentation, I did talk about domestic violence. I talked about dowry related issues. I talked about uh, polygamy. These are going on in the camp situation also. And domestic violence is on the rise in the uh, camp situation. About justice, yes, there are, there are justice mechanisms. The Maji system is there. Uh, Maji, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, through, I mean, they have, uh, through arbitration, uh, they try to resolve uh, these issues. Then the camp management is there. RRC, Triple RC is there, which takes care of the issues. And there are legal aid bodies who are working in the camps who do, who do deal with issues like this. So I shall take the final question by Sriponna, uh, who thanks you for the uh, lecture and she asks, in the camp areas, displaced people are not allowed to work or generate proper incomes. Registered Rohingyas receive limited cash or are they involved in informal economy that pays very less cash? If it is so, then how do they get the money for dowry or to make the journey to go to Malaysia or Indonesia? Yes, this is a question I also ask them that how do they get the money? To, uh, uh, they told me that uh, uh, they collect the money from the, you know, like uh, they said, Chada Duli. You know, everybody donates and they collect the money. Uh, but uh, I would uh, want to believe that uh, they have informal contacts uh, uh, with uh, people on the other side and uh, they are through informal channels and through different mechanisms, they receive money from, uh, like they told me that they receive money from their relatives also. 
and uh, so you know these uh, underhand dealings uh, because camp situation is not a very ideal situation and uh, and uh, like uh, when they told me that they bought gold and i was quite taken aback that how could they buy gold uh, when they do not have uh, any money but uh, i found that uh, they did bring a uh, cash with them when they were fleeing they had uh, gold with them they had cash with them and they said that uh, they had hidden the those things uh, the cash and the gold uh, you know like uh, and they brought it uh, with them but they said that we all contribute to raise uh, to raise this money this is what they told me uh, so onindu shen also has a question and he hasn't written so maybe you can just ask by unmuting yeah okay so ma'am thank you for the nice presentation that was very enlightening uh, i have actually two questions uh, one is uh, uh, what kind of uh, responses are you having in bangladesh among the general population of bangladesh about this rohingya refugee issue whether whether they are whether the general population is empathetic towards their situation or they are worried that this might go out of control uh that is my first question uh the second one is uh, you 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 said that uh, the rohingyas were not directly related to any uh, cessationist movements uh what i wanted to ask was uh, was there accusation in myanmar that illegal Im immigration is happening in in myanmar in these areas in, in the arakan areas uh, with the help of the rohingyas uh, illegal muslim immigration was there some accusation like that at any point thank you thank you as for your first question i mean yes there was lot of empathy as well as sympathy for the rohingyas when they first came and uh, like the first responders were the community people i mean uh, people who when they were i mean when they first started arriving people who were going to the mosque uh, to say their fajr prayers you know early morning prayers they saw them coming and the people they offered them food they gave them shelter and there was there was an outpour or pouring of empathy as well as sympathy to so among the host community i would say that a host community i mean people in cox's bazar they suddenly found that they were they have become a minority uh and uh, Uh, one did find uh, like uh, uh, being in, uh, around 2018 19 there was not i wouldn't say there were resistance uh, to that but there was like there were concerns uh, that things would uh, go out of control but at the same time you know like uh, there is a political economy also of refugeehood and uh, if you go and uh, one could see that hotels were making a very good business and uh, all these um, all the donor uh, uh, um, uh, unesia the un different donor agencies i not only ngos but ngos were there so they were all flooding uh, cox's bazaar and people were getting employment also so there was this concern also that what would happen to the education of the youth because uh, you know the youth they were getting good cash out of they were working as uh, um, interpreters because their dialect the local uh, dialect is similar to that of the rohingya people so one needed translators to get into the camps and talk to them and uh, the college uh, uh, girls and college uh, uh, boys they were doing these jobs so lot of employment was also generated though among the local community there was resentment and they were uh, thinking that what would happen to their culture and there were incidents where you know 
like uh, there were uh, some uh, violence that did take place uh, uh, at that point of time. But right into in 2021, I would say that there are concerns, not only in Cox's Bazaar, but also now, you know, in Bangladesh, because if you see the World Bank report that has come out, and if you see the different uh, positions that states are taking, that what would happen, I mean, the and, and as I pointed out earlier, that Bangladesh, or, I mean, it is an honest statement that Bangladesh is not in a position to integrate this huge population. If you look at the, and, uh, and what, and, more importantly, if, even if Bangladesh was in a position, I don't think that this is the right way of approaching the problem. Then, you know, Myanmar would get away with a genocide. And one cannot, be, and uh, we cannot be a party, uh, party to something, uh, you know, like uh, you can get away with a genocide and uh, other countries keep on investing over there and Bangladesh takes all the flag. This is a very, I mean, uh, uh, this is the kind of situation that Bangladesh is in now at the moment. So uh, Bangladesh's position, not at only at the state level, but also I think at the societal level, at this point of time is that the international community should, should come ahead and it should for uh, it should uh, uh, you know like uh, force Myanmar to amend its citizenship law and take back Ma but there is no I mean at the same time I want to make it very clear that uh, in Bangladesh it is strongly felt that Rohingyas should go back only when they are ready to go back and when they, they feel that they are secure and they are ready to go back and they should be given citizenship but there are genuine concerns because uh, things might be uh, because of the pandemic situation also uh, that uh, things might get out of control. About the allegations, I've, I've also heard of these allegations when we, that uh, you are talking about that uh, Rohingyas are uh, helping. Uh, 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 but then, you know, like, uh, Muslim immigration is different from Bengali Muslim immigration uh, or migration. I, I mean, uh, it's not, a, I mean, why should, uh, I don't think any Bangladeshi would want to migrate uh, either to India or for that matter to Myanmar. Because if you look at Bangladesh's economic situation, it is much better than both the countries. Uh, and why would, I mean, there has to be some pull factors. No, I'm talking about those factors. If you're talking about violent extremism or violent extremist groups, I mean, there, I mean, there are movements all around the world. So that I cannot uh, vouch for that, you know, Rohingyas are involved or not involved. I mean, we have heard of allegations. We have heard of, you know, like uh, things happening even along the borders of the Chittagong Hill treks. But this is a genuine concern in Bangladesh when I say that things might get out of control. Uh, that because, uh, and now what is happening in Afghanistan, global scenario into account. And uh, that uh, what would happen? And uh, you can't blame the Rohingyas for, for it. I mean, uh, this is a very desperate situation. Uh, for the uh, for the Rohingya people, and uh, they, nobody would want to remain in a as ref, uh, uh, I mean they are not even uh, recognized as refugees. They are known as uh, forcibly displaced people from Myanmar. So in a situation like this, they would want to get, get out of the situation. They would want to run away. That's why we see boat people, we see boats sinking, we see tra human uh, human trafficking happening. We see that you know violence is happening, and not only violence within the camps. We have also reports uh, uh, that you know, like Rohingyas are getting out of the camps and they are uh, committing different kinds of crimes. But I don't know. But this, these are very minor incidents. Again, you know, given the. Uh, that we have 1 million population there in such a small area. 
uh, this is a very um, i would say it is very uh, it is kept at a very minimum uh, minim, minimalist level uh, but uh, i also genuinely feel that uh, things might get unstable if it, if the th if situation continues to be like this and for which the entire region as well as the global community has to take responsibility uh, thank you very much amina di we are absolutely on time i don't see any more comment or questions uh, and on that note where you concluded i mean i was just wondering while listening to you and agreeing to a large extent but also on the point that nasrindi raised uh, in terms of uh, michel ajir that you know how camps in south asia are requiring a semi urban uh, characteristic and uh, i mean at least in cox's bazaar the nature and you mentioned donors uh, ngos how this entire infrastructure is kind of sustaining this so i don't know even if myanmar through some miracle um amends the law how far assist i mean this would be altered we can just only uh, look ahead and see what uh, holds uh, in the future so uh, i don't know whether uh, shomuta di wants to come in and uh, has any comment uh, rafiqullah has raised his hand again okay you have a final so, question yeah so a very brief comment and then maybe we can come I just I just want to clarification. Like I also wanted to know uh, what are the uh, like what are the other violences and abuse that women face in the camp by the own community. Uh, are you asking what are what are the other kinds of violences that women face from their own community? Yeah. Apart from the abuse. uh your audio is not very clear i don't know uh, amina did you get the question or uh, i can is it what kinds of barriers uh, or uh, violences that women face from within the community from yeah provided from the community from from their own community yeah Well, uh, uh, like uh, traditionally, I mean, I, I was talking about referring to the uh, culture. You know, the the cultural baggage that they carry with them. That women are not girls are not allowed to uh, receive a uh, education, and they think consider it to be a sin. Uh, restrictions on movement, polygamy itself. I think it's a violation. Uh, I mean, I talked. Um, so we have different kinds of viol uh, violations uh, or uh, violence if you call it like uh, restrictions on education restrictions on movement which is imposed from within the community also early marriage uh, frequent pregnancies this also i consider it to be a violation uh, then uh, uh, why you know like uh, while beating is very common uh, the dowry these are the uh, you know different kinds of uh, restrictions or violations that they face from within the community and and it is interesting that women also internalize these they think it is okay i mean uh, i mean when i say vom, uh, women also inter internalize this i'm say, i'm using uh, uh, the women category as a plural category i mean there are please take it as a differentiated approach there are generational things over there and uh, like uh, now shuchurita i don't know if you came across girl ambassadors or you know like um, women friendly spaces in the camps then education for girls all these are there so things are changing and again as a you know like uh, there are differences in a uh, responses and uh, to oh. some extent uh, like i was uh, in a let me just point this out that i was in a, a panel discussion on the rohingya refugees at the north south university and there was a participant from the rohingya community and when i said that when i was talking about the, the education for girls 
and uh, an end to polygamy and all those things. And he being a participant of that program, he said to me that the that uh, you know you should stop meddling with our culture. And he said to me in very good English. So maybe you know when people feel threatened, uh, because this this is a community which feels it is threatened. So you go back to the trope of your own culture, your own identity, and this is an identity which has been constructed. I mean, when they say that it is sin for a girl to get higher education, maybe out of insecurity, years of persecution, you know, it has come down as a custom. So you need to have that level of confidence and you need to have that kind of environment to allow women or, the, or you feel the, not only allow women, but also allow your community to come out of that groove. Because even if, if I talk of Chittagong Hill Tracks, I find that, you know, like uh, they do not want to give uh, uh, property rights to their uh, girls. And in fact, one of their leaders who was who spearheaded the movement, he said to me very clearly that please don't impose your Bengali culture among our women. When I was talking in the, you know, about property rights for or land rights for women in the Chittagong Hill Tract, some of them do have property rights, but not all of them have property rights. That's what I'm trying to say, that uh, maybe when you are in you feel threatened, you want to hold on to you, your own culture, no matter how uh, oppressive it might be. Uh, thank you so much, Aminadi, for your time and for that excellent talk and also the interaction. So I want to thank all participants for your questions and comments. And uh, Shamotadi, um, okay, she has also said uh, no more, she doesn't have any more comments. So. We shall meet again next weekend. And Aminadi, you are most welcome to join us uh, whenever time permits. Thank you very, very much once again. Thank you. Thank you.